There she is. Hooray. Oh, wait, wait, hold on. More light. <laughs> you know how it is when you're your own tech person, your own everything. Like, there used to be people for this. Oh, you're very different. But I don't have people. I want people for this. <laughs> I do too. We'll be each other's people. Okay. Love it. Oh, just got myself a job. That was easy. <laughs> Right, I'll just start and pretend we've never spoken before in our lives. What acting this will be. Hello, Yardley. How are you doing? I'm so good. I'm so happy to be here. Oh, but I'm, I'm happier for you to be here. I don't care how happy you are. I am happier. Mm, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, you're actually right. I, I couldn't care less, really. I'm not bothered <laughs> at all. Although, I, I was just saying, I woke up this morning like, yeah, fresh. I'm going to speak to Yardley woke up with this bad boy here so throughout the entire interview i'm gonna be like doing cool posing leans like this i'm all good your secret is safe with me i probably shouldn't have opened with that like how many interviews have you had where you're going oh i've got a horrible spot do you get that often you know what i do that i'm like oh god i did an interview this morning actually and they said what time is it there is it like eight in the morning i said no it's 10 but i know i look like it's eight they're like, oh, no, 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 you look great. I was like, mm, sorry. <laughs> I know what you were saying. I wish James Lipton did that when you was on Inside the Actors Studio, just sort of like, by the way, huge spot there. Right. Good thing he got a big beard as well. Cover it up. <laughs> that would have been great. He could have used a little humility like that, a little humor about himself. <laughs> That's what I thought. He, need he needed to be spottier. <laughs> yes. I think... Me and you should celebrate today because, sure, it's April Fool's Day. Yes, it is Susan Boyle's birthday today. We all know that. Oh. But today is also the day season 10 of Small Town Dicks Drops. <laughs> that was awful. <laughs> you buy cheap, you get cheap. Sometimes you get what you pay for. If anything, this is really cutting into me. I think I need to lose. Oh, <laughs> how are you uh, going to celebrate small town dicks dropping today? Because I've bought party blowers, so I want you to up that. Oh, that's great. I'm going to have a cocktail, actually. Just the one? Well, probably maybe three. Maybe like one to three. Your publicist is on the call. You still have to be semi-professional. It is. <laughs> It's true. I just have to sound professional. Yeah. I have to just, I have to not slap anybody in public and have to sound like I'm on the ball. That's all. That's all I'm going to say. Imagine saying that. For me to be professional, I just have to not slap someone. That's what we're, <laughs> that's what we've got to now. That's where we are. That's the kind of restraint you have to um, employ. It's a pretty big range. There's a lot of stuff that can happen between now and slap. <laughs> I can't believe Will's ruined that for us. I used to love being professional and slapping people. <laughs> so annoying. <laughs> when I was doing my research for this, I got a little bit like sweaty and anxiety because every time I type small town dicks into Google, I don't know what's going to come up. Like Google images, I, that scared me a little bit there. So how, how did you decide on the name for this? Uh, we blame Detective Dan, who came up with the name. So for anyone who doesn't know, I co-host this podcast with identical twin detectives, Dan and Dave. And when we were coming up with a name, Dan, who's actually really good at titles, came up with Small Town Dicks. And we were like, oh, my God, it made us laugh so hard because Dicks being the noir slang for detective. Although, you know, most people don't know that so it, and it actually belies the seriousness and really the reverence that we address these cases with um all of the cases are told by the detectives who investigated them and it's really very uh respectful of the victims it's not a it's not a chatty humorous sort of free-for-all about crime it's really kind of buttoned up so but meanwhile we'd already decided on the name and we'd you know, uh, we bought the domain and stuff. And so now we're just like, well, you either get it or you don't. It's, it's, there's no shame in having a little bit of humor amid the dark. And what amazes me about it is that I listened to it and 
you talk about cases I've never heard of, and I doubt a lot of people have really heard of. Do you ever get people approach you and just be like, I learned about this because of you. Like you were the first time I ever heard of this. Yes, yes. And actually when we choose cases, uh, Dan and Dave do the vetting and of the detectives and they always want to know like, oh my God, because originally, and, and for the most part, all of the cases come from small towns because the premise was big time crime is happening in small towns everywhere, but with less frequency, but, but no less depravity or reckless disregard for human life. Um, and small town police departments are expected to put out the same high level of work product as a big city department, but with so many fewer resources. So there are particular challenges in being part of a small town law enforcement agency. And so when detectives come on and they, they've never been on the podcast before, they're like, oh God, what do I talk about? And we're like, we want the case you're most proud of. Doesn't have to be the, mo the one that's most well-known. Um, we don't necessarily at all want the one that made the papers. We want to know the one where you, you had like an aha moment or all the pieces fell into place when you thought they never would or you really learned something from the process. So that's how we choose them. And it's true, unless you live in the town, you, you probably haven't heard of the crime. But even if you live in the town, chances are you've never heard such a granular um, sort of un a granular telling of the tale of how all of the dominoes needed to line up perfectly in order for justice to be served. So it's good. It's really interesting. Well, the fact that you also get like, you have audio clips and you have like interviews and all of that sort of stuff. It all, as you said, you may have seen it in the newspaper or on like Google or something, but you don't get this level of information. I mean, it must be hell sourcing all of that information as well no it can be very difficult we file foias which is a freedom of information act um document you have to file to get documents that are not open to the public so we always file a foia when we get audio assets like that um and some police departments are more willing to uh cooperate and be speedy uh than others um and sometimes we, even though we filed a FOIA, we don't get the material, but it's always worth trying because I feel like those audio assets really put you in the moment. They put you in the case, like in the story. So you can't beat that. If you can get it, you should use it. Listen to you using all of the lingo and everything here. Like at this point, <laughs> I could just see you as a police officer. Fingers crossed this acting works for you, but if not, you know, if you don't get any good gigs, you could go into police force. Would you do it? Thanks. No. <laughs> <laughs> I am, I'm, I'm a recovering people pleaser and, a, and I hate conflict. I would be a terrible police officer. Terrible. I could maybe, maybe, I do know that they have, although I think they're often part of the police force, at least in smaller towns, certainly, where they have a media liaison. Oh, that sounds intimidating. Yeah, which is kind of a shit job because you you get all the questions that you probably can't answer, aren't supposed to answer, literally can't answer. Um, so that kind of puts you in the hot seat, but that's all the thing I might be good for. I'm not good for much, Daniel, not good for much. Your publicist is there going, why is she saying she's not good for much? <laughs> I oh, know. I'm, I'm famous for my candor. Went, like it or lump it. That's how it goes. That's how I roll. <laughs> you, you mentioned him then, D Detective Dan, your partner. Great name, by the way, because I'm just Dan. I don't have detective. Like, I pale in comparison to that. <laughs> Bit annoying. You could be pirate Dan. I mean, I really feel like you could take anything you want to be and put it ahead of Dan. But is that a good pirate? That's really that good. That's really good. Oh, my God. Uh, am I an actor as well now? Yeah, you could be Pirate Dan. But you could also just be Awesome Dan. You created your own fucking show, dude. That's incredible. That's not easy to do. Oh, God, you're telling me. You are telling me. I haven't left the house in about four years now just doing this. Yeah, and you think, oh, you know, like when we started this podcast and it was decided that all of the cases would, should be told by the detectives, so Dan and Dave should obviously be the ones they started out telling the stories, and uh, we thought, oh, it'll be fun. We'll just, you know, get some really good equipment. So it sounds great. And we'll, well, we'll probably need an editor because I don't want it to be sort of a lot of crosstalk and noise in your face. 
Um, and so we're like, great, no idea what we're doing. And oh my fucking God, it is such a heavy lift to, cur to curate a show that where literally, you know, if the, if the detectives usually takes about 90 minutes to tell a story, because, you know, it's, most people aren't professional storytellers. And there are, uh, there are side tangents, and then there are interruptions, and then there are things. So you cut all that shit out, and it comes down to about 50 minutes to an hour, roughly. That means that somebody is combing through all of that, making sure you take out at least the bulk of the ums. We never remove the silences because those are always really interesting, but it's not, you, it's not just push play or push record or like, Wee! and then publish. And now, as you know, listeners are so sophisticated. They won't, they won't stand for bad sound. They won't stand for a shittily produced podcast. I remember the first interview I did, it was during like the beginning of lockdown and my mic, I, well, I didn't have a mic. So the whole time I'm asking questions, I'm... <laughs> Uh, how how anyone watched that? I don't know. I think it was just my mum on repeat. Bless her, going refresh. That'll have another view. Refresh. <laughs> You're so charming. I'm quite sure people are like this. This dude is great. I turn it on. I'm not charming. This is all turned on. As soon as the mic's off, I'm a horrible human. You're a hor me too. Oh, I, yeah. No, you didn't need to tell me that. I could tell. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm I'm surly. Uh, I'm, I'm grumpy. I'm an introvert. I'm Kind of an asshole, sure. Again, weirdly, that's what your publicist said before you joined the call. <laughs> nice, nice of her to, to <laughs> dime me out, as we say, in crime. So, Detective Dan, or, well, if I'm awesome, Dan, let's call Detective Dan not as awesome Dan. We'll call him that. <laughs> uh, your words, not mine. But he he's introduced you into the world of police and true crime. When are you going to bring him into the world of Simpsons? When are you going to get him on an episode? Well, we sort of got on an episode, so uh, not last season, excuse me, two seasons ago, we did an episode called Podcast News, where Kent Brockman starts his own podcast. He decides he's going to give up the evening news, and I made an appearance as myself, as Yardley, and, Kent, and I see him in a bar like Sardi's, which is a very famous theater bar in, in New York City that has caricature drawings of like everybody who's ever been on Broadway, right? So, uh, so they had some great podcast greats on the wall. And Kent Brackman says, your voice sounds familiar. Where have I heard it before? And I said, from my true crime podcast, Small Town Dicks and nowhere else. And so I feel like that was pretty close. That was pretty good. And oh, that's good because he gets the name check in there, but also he doesn't get the paycheck. That's, it's hard to do. Yeah. And now we have to talk about something else and I could I could do this like elaborate introduction I could do this big spiel for it or I could just introduce it by saying favorites oh Daniel which you say at the beginning of every episode oil and water yes <laughs> as someone who cannot cook for love nor money this is the dream for me because that's how I do all of my meals because you you pair up ingredients that don't match that's what I do every day, but accidentally. So I created a game during the pandemic because I'm actually quite a good cook. Show off. Well, you know, I, it's my one mini skill. I can keep you fed. That's pretty, that's not terrible. Um, so I thought instead of doing just a regular old cooking show where you, I can tell you like what a great cook I am. I thought, wouldn't it be funny if I took two ingredients randomly drawn and made them into a thing that's also randomly drawn and it actually started because I cooked a thing that had been on one of the Simpsons shorts called porkified fish nuglets where Homer smashes together pork and ground up fish and makes these little sort of fish sticks for Bart for dinner so I made those and actually they were not terrible. Homer's a genius. He is a hidden genius. He's, he's not always a genius, but he was a genius there. And I thought, wouldn't it be funny if I made that into a whole show? And so I did that for a year plus. And then I got a little tired of putting sardines in my ice cream. So I came up with a, I morphed it into, wouldn't it be great to actually make stuff that's good, but let's take stuff that looks really good and then 
make it and see if it's stupid good, which is like ultimate good. So now I take these recipes I've never made from so far a bunch of, a lot of internet chefs or a lot of people cooking on the internet and um, try them out and see if they're stupid good. And we've had a couple of great home runs, but I just thought, you know, it's my on-camera career was really robust for the first 15 years of my career. And then it really started to die out and thank God I still had the Simpsons. But at the end of the day, I, I really love an audience. You know, I, it's sort of what I, it's all I've done all my life. So, um, and I was slow to the party of creating your own content, sort of forging your own way. I was way back when I started out in 82, you probably weren't even alive. Where are you, Daniel? No way, me. No. <laughs> no. Little young me. <laughs> Little you, not even a twinkle in your mother's eye. <laughs> um, you know, I used to just go to auditions and I often would get the job. I was, I worked really hard and I, you know, ticked a certain box and I worked a lot. And then as I got older, when I couldn't play a teenager anymore, even though I looked really, really young, but if you put me next to a teenager, now there was like, oh no, there's something in her eyes. She's seen too much. Um, I had to sort of, I stopped getting a lot of work. So anyway, that was a, also sort of a lot of, I just wanted to do something outside of The Simpsons. And so I created these cooking shows. Well, we spoke about Detective Dan, or as we now know him, not as awesome Dan, <laughs> second best Dan. Second best Dan. <laughs> oh, he's not behind the camera, is he? Just there cracking his knuckles. <laughs> he will come for you. <laughs> no, I meant second best to Daniel Day-Lewis. That's all right, right? Yes. Dodge that one. <laughs> Clever you. Firstly, congratulations, because you two are getting married soon. We are. Congratulations. Um, I assume... My invites, I probably lost in like airmail or something. Uh, actually, they haven't quite been sent out yet. So, yes. Yes. Because I thought if I'm not invited, God, imagine that. That would be awkward. Imagine how embarrassing it will be. Yes, that would be very awkward. And I'd hate to give you a bad edit on this interview if I didn't get invited, Yardley. Just saying. I would hate that. Okay, noted. Thanks for the heads up. Will there be... <laughs> an oil and water themed buffet at the wedding. Like I'm thinking, I mean, you've done cereal on ground turkey, cherry tomato parfaits, like this cake better have like balsamic vinegar in it and stuff. Sure, it's gonna have anchovies in the icing, you know? And then like probably a lot, like actual little anchovies as part of the decor. I don't know, just thought maybe freak the people out. Have them show up and go, what the fuck <laughs> is that? What is happening? Can you imagine? Wouldn't that be hilarious if you just brought out a wedding cake that just had like little squiggly anchovies laid across the top with some flowers and people are like, oh God, oh God, oh God. They're all taking back their wedding presents that they gave you. I don't want to be here. <laughs> bring, get, bring back the toaster. This was, ah, uh, yeah, I feel not, I feel unwell. Um, I think I'm coming down with something or everything. I have to go. It's great, but you guys have a great party and a great life. Gone. <laughs> you you mentioned that oil and water started from, you know, creating a, a recipe on The Simpsons. I mean, I always wanted to eat the power sauce bar. I don't know why. I'm the least athletic human in the world. <laughs> but seeing that, I was like, I want to eat it. I don't know why. Was there a food in The Simpsons that you were like, that looks delicious? No, most of the Simpsons food is terrible. Like, it's fucking awful. <laughs> that says a lot about our differences, because I look at it, I'm like, oh, look. When you do? When Homer ate the cheese slices to the point where he went blind, I legit do that. <laughs> like, genuinely, I could power through cheese slices like nobody's business. I hear it. I, I love cheese. That's a good, yeah, I get it. But I feel like we actually have had premiere parties for the Simpsons when we used to have premiere parties you know for the beginning of the season where they they served bar like what you would serve at Moe's bar so pickled eggs and other weird pickled things and you know terrible not good little mini hamburgers that we only did that a couple of years and I think people were sort of 
like, you know, I don't want to live in the cartoon. How many pickled eggs can I have? Gross. Like, whoever wants to eat a pickled egg? Nobody wants that. It's like oil and water, but neither of the ingredients are good at that point. Yes, neither, none of it. That is just a mistake. That's literally like somebody went, oh shit, I have too, I boiled too many eggs and I peeled too many, now what? Well, I need to preserve them. Let me put them in some used pickle juice. Oh. Anything that begins with pickled, I'm out. Right. <laughs> Although I do like, a, you don't like a dill pickle on your hamburger? Ah, you're right. I've I've given too much slander to pickles. <laughs> I told you I'm a monster. Yeah, well, you are a monster. But I like you. If we were together, I, we would have the best time. Oh, well, we will be at your wedding. Oh, that's true. Which I'm 100% going to. Great. I forgot. Already forgot. But that's good. To, oh, good. This brings me on to, and I'm going to say it, the best TV show that there has ever been I mean, I know I say this to whenever I have a guest on and they're promoting a TV show, I say it to them, but with you, I actually mean it. Like The Simpsons, hands down, my favorite, favorite. I mean, I'm repping the Lisa merch today. Love it. This is my pride and joy, this baby. Did you, did you see, I have the Lisa Simpson for President Vans um, high tops. Oh my God. They, they did a capsule collection, I want to say about a year and a half ago. Um, they never send us this stuff, by the way. So I, that's why I'm like, where did you get that hat? What the hell? Well, now I feel guilty. I feel like I'm going to have to awkwardly send you this now. Like, here you go. No, you're just going to have to wear it to the wedding and then give it to me as a gift at the wedding. As I'm chowing down <laughs> on your weird fishy cake. Oh, brilliant. <laughs> Who's the winner here? <laughs> you know. <laughs> Obviously, The Simpsons first aired on the Tracy Ullman show in like, I want to say 87. Uh, yes, 87. Which means you've been voicing Lisa for over three decades. Yes, yeah, about 100 years. She doesn't look bad for 34. Fair play to Lisa Simpson. Uh, right? <laughs> Between you and me, have you ever like woken up one day and just gone, I need to throw a sickie. I can't be voicing Lisa today. <laughs> I've been doing this too long. <laughs> no, um, no. But I do, you know, once in a while, I'm sick enough where so if this is me this is lisa simpson hi daniel it's so nice to have a chat with you this is lisa simpson wishing that you could come over for a squishy uh, anyway. genuinely, i'm this close to crying <laughs> i'm just being passed out in the rest of the interview now <laughs> like that. you can't do an interview with lisa simpson and not have lisa simpson show up for the interview genuinely i was like do i be do I be professional and not ask her to do it? Oh, God. I'm so glad you did. Of course. Um, but I, so, uh, yes, obviously, I've uh, on occasion been so sick where I, even, when I've recorded it even, they're like, we can't use that. You're going to have to come back and do that over. Luckily, it takes eight or nine months to animate one episode. So there are at least, I would say, four stages where they can do a pretty extensive rewrite um if a joke's not working or the show is too long uh they had to cut something out now they need one line to cover like the last five minutes whatever it is um where they can do those rewrites and it's not prohibitively expensive for the animation so even though we record so we'll do a table read we when pre-pandemic now we're doing the table reads on zoom p.s zoom is a comedy killer it is so fucking hard. It is so brutal because there's a tiny bit of delay. And of course, comedy is all timing. And so even that, it's it's been really hard just to really get to get a true sense of whether or not the script is landing. In any case, we have the best writers in the world and they've been extraordinary animators as well. And so, but pre-pandemic, we used to do a table read all together like in a huge conference room and there would actually be people around the edges of the conference, sort of like an audience. Um, and uh, what was the question? Did, did you ever get bored and want to throw a sickie? Oh yeah, yeah. Um, uh, oh yeah, so I was telling you what the process is. God, I'm sorry, it was just a massive brain fart there, but it's <laughs> terrible. Um, uh, so we do this read through and it's the first, 
time that the writers hear the script all the way through with the actors doing it. It's really sort of the only time that they hear it from start to finish without any breaks. Then 10 days later, we come back, they've done a rewrite, several rewrites, and we record that episode again, all together like an old radio play. We do each scene four times. If it's still not right, then they'll do pickups. Um, and then they assemble that and give it to the animators to start drawing. So, but despite, so, so the first recording is really sort of a, a top level start, but it's not at all necessarily the finish. This, depending on who has eyes on it, sort of how long it takes, blah, blah, so many things, it can go through multiple transformations. So it's kind of, even though we all give 100% at that first recording, because you want it, everybody to get off at the, in the best possible way, right? You want a strong start. You'll be coming back to do ADR for that without a doubt, no matter how brilliant you were. And one of my favorite, like one of my favorite directions is they'll be, they'll do it four times. And they'll go, that's perfect. Okay, do it again. <laughs> Make it more perfect. So, yes, exactly. So not as perfect as perfect, a little bit <laughs> kind of perfect, 89% perfect. So you just sort of go, okay, that's the way it is. So. I mean, this show has been my favorite for as long as I can remember. So when I ask you this ne next question, it's not be like being inquisitive or just curious. This is like life or death for me now. Okay. Like, you know, when the Mayans predicted like the world would end in 2012, that's what this is for me. Okay. Luckily they were wrong, but go on. They were? Oh, I said some horrible things in 2011's people. <laughs> and yet you're still here. Oh yeah, you're right. How did I miss that? Has there ever been a discussion about the last ever episode of The Simpsons? Uh, no, actually, not seriously. So- Thank you. Yes, <laughs> phew, <laughs> you're welcome. I mean, we all, so we're, we just started recording season 34 and which is a crazy sentence in and of itself because most shows last, you're lucky if it lasts five years, which means you hit the 100 episode mark, which means you'll get residuals. You're lucky. Like, but nowadays, even three seasons is like the whole streaming just upended the entire industry. In any case, so we started recording season 34. It's the, it's the last of our two season pickups. So we had a pickup for 33 and 34. <clears throat> but I feel like we would be given a pretty big heads up for the last season because at the very least, Disney who bought Fox, right? All but Fox News and Fox Sports. Um, what it, they Part of the reason they bought it was for The Simpsons. You're not gonna own it for, it's maybe coming up on four or five years now and then go, okay, well, that was good. We're done. I don't think that's going to happen. Also, if it were the last season, I think they would want to capitalize on that and make, you know, bazillions on advertising. So I, I feel as though I, I'd never say the job where the job is safe, but I feel like considering how many, how much content streaming services need, they can never have enough. If somebody is literally going to binge your whole series in a weekend, you're fucked like what are you gonna like how do you keep that voracious appetite fed it's a huge thing so um yeah and also you know a few couple three years ago or so we won um a pulitzer another uh yes uh peabody sorry peabody it's a p a Peabody, another, a second Peabody, you know, we still get nominated for Emmys. We're still in the news. It's still extraordinarily relevant. And I think the shows are great. We read a script last Thursday, uh, what's today? Friday, a script, what is Friday? We read a script yesterday. Hi, um, that is fantastic. It's a great, great, it was so funny. And for a script to be that, lively and um vivid over zoom means it's fucking incredible yeah it's really really great so 
super excited. I'm just, it really has been a joy in every way. I really mean that. That's a relief to hear because I'm, I'm still sat here with bated breath for a sequel to the Simpsons movie. I need this in my life. It hasn't everybody. I don't want it. I need it. <laughs> Is there rumors of one possibly happening? And even if not, lie and I can have some sweet clickbait. I don't mind. <laughs> sure. I do think that there will be another movie. So there's your clickbait. Thank you. <laughs> I have no idea when. I will say one of the issues is it's it's such a labor intensive show behind the scenes, certainly not for the actors, but for the writers and the animators that to siphon off any group of actors to basically engage in another full-time job to write and animate a full-length film is untenable at the moment. But that doesn't that's just today. I do really believe that there will be a number two. And my pitch is it should be a Christmas movie so that it has annual rev- relevance for the rest of time. Oh, uh, yeah, think, I mean, who like the Grinch. Right? Like Elf and the Grinch and all of your favorite Christmas movies. You're like, oh my God, I can't wait to watch it again. It fills you with this great, you know, even if you're not like, I didn't grow up with religion in my life, but I love Christmas. And so I love the music, I love the food, I love the lights, I love everything about it. You're so right. Even if you don't want to watch it, you're like, oh, the Grinch is on, but I'm contractually obliged to watch it because it's December the 12th. I have to. Yes! (laughs) And then you're glad you did, right? Yeah, yeah, and then it works out great. Yeah. One last thing, because again, something I need, the world needs. (laughs) I mean, are are you a gamer yourself? Do you play video games? No. But you must have played, and again, I'm not just saying this because you're here, the best video game of all time, The Simpsons Hit and Run. Oh, Hit and Run. No, but I no, but I did do a lot of uh, dialogue blurbs, like pickups, exclamations for that game, which was really, really fun. And I, weren't there a couple of versions of that game, of Hit and Run? Did they, yeah. Because I feel like I did at least a couple of times. And I remember being so happy that it was really successful. You know, I'm 57, Daniel. Fucking like video games. You remember the little game? It was a handheld thing. And it was a car that was on a little speedway. But all you had were like a little button that sort of slid back and forth to avoid. the. So it goes left and right. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's exactly what hit and run was. Oh, Oh, I probably would have loved it. Can you still get it? Well, that's what, it, how much would I have to pay you to ask Matt and the rest of the team to make a remastered or a sequel to this? I will pay you. Not a lot. I'm very broke. Yeah, sure. I spent it all on Lisa Simpson merch. <laughs> I will ask for free because you're fabulous. You've gone from awesome Daniel to fabulous Daniel. Oh my God. Fabulous monster Daniel. Um, it would be my pleasure. I will ask about that. Pinky promise? Yes. Oh. I don't know how we do this. Have have that. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. Got it. That was the most surreal thing I've ever done in my whole life. And I will even send you a response. Oh my God. So you can do a little mini update on Movie Dweeb. I feel like, like I've just signed a peace treaty or something. Like, I feel like I'm going to win a Nobel Peace Prize for this, for getting Hit and Run 2 out on shelves. Thank you. I'm re- That would actually be awesome. I think, you know, I loved it. We also did a thing. I wasn't part of it because it was just Homer's voice. And Dan Castle, that is so brilliant. So, so brilliant. He does so many voices. And I get to stand, I stand between Dan and Nancy. So for anybody who doesn't know, Nancy does Bart. Um, and... So I stand between the two of them to watch Dan have a scene with only his characters where he goes from voice to voice to voice, never gets old, never gets old. I could watch it all day long. Um, So anyhow, I was saying, so you remember Garmin had a a GPS, uh, you could like, it was external, right? You could just keep it on your dashboard or something. And it was Homer Simpson's voice telling you that you'd taken a wrong turn or you were 
going to be late or you were on the right track, or whatever. I thought, oh, it's so brilliant. This is so, so good. Like they've come up with some really great stuff. The problem with that is if I had a 10 minute journey, I'd go deliberately wrong. It would take me an hour and a half because I'd just enjoy <laughs> listening to Homer. I'd right? be late to everything. I know, I know. <laughs> I think it's so great. And maybe it contributed to a lot of air pollution because people were just getting in their cars so they could <laughs> listen to Homer, even when they didn't have anywhere to go. Just so. sat on their drive. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> it's because of Dan that there's global warming. I'm going to tell him that. Excellent. Thanks a bunch. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Dan. Other Dan. Oh, the really not awesome Dan. <laughs> Thank you, honestly, so much for chatting to me. Oh, such a pleasure. This is a dream come true. As I said, this, <laughs> for me, I'm going to put it back in its glass plinth now. <laughs> with the lasers around it so no one can touch it. I mean... I've spoken to an Emmy winner. I've spoken to someone who sung with Lady Gaga. Yes. Oh, let me just, can I just tell you what that was like? Uh, yes. So Lady Gaga came in to record with us, which is rare for the big celebrities because their schedules are so busy. We were so thrilled and she was wonderful, brilliant, so humble, so game, like anything we asked her to do. You know, you have to tell people that we do each scene four times so they don't think it's just them. Like, this is just the process. This is how it goes. She was, like, totally down with that. So it was a great day. She looked beautiful. And um, she was so funny. And then I go in a couple, well, I want to say a couple of months later, to do the singing. And Lady Gaga has already put down her part of the track for this duet between Lady Gaga and Lisa Simpson. And, I'm, and they play it for me because, so that I can, like, and I'm like, why, why are you so cruel? Why are you <laughs> fucking doing this? What are you kidding me? Have you, I mean, listen to that. I, as Lisa Simpson, I have like a three note range. You want me to sing with that? That is so mean. It's so mean. I was mortified. Thank God she wasn't there. Oh my God. I was just like, what, what is you guys? You guys, all the writers work out their angst with Lisa Simpson. I'm like, okay, listen, there's only so much I can accommodate. I just was, I just thought, oh, I mean, of all of us in the cast, I would say Lisa Simpson sing, sounds the best maybe when I sing, right? Like they, I, because I sound so much like myself, right? This is me. This is Lisa Simpson. There's not that much difference. And, and so, I'm probably the most musical, but it's not music, people. It's not the same as singing with somebody like Natalie Maines or Lady Gaga or any number of other people who've come on who actually make a living at that. So I was like, meanwhile, they, they continue to make me sing, so. <laughs> That's because, again, the writers aren't invited to the wedding. They've gone, give her another song. No. <laughs> well, if they stopped giving me songs, maybe they would be. <laughs> but just think, just only like Beyonce and Ariana Grande have collabed with Lady Gaga. You're up there with them three now. I know. It's listen. It was it was rare air. I I recognized the privilege. I I just felt a little embarrassed. I felt like I wasn't quite up to the task. But obviously, in context, because I play a cartoon. It's not like Lady Gaga and Yardley Smith in concert. That would be a disaster, but... Because you'd keep up staging her. Yeah. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Just be pleased you didn't have a poos note at the end of Who Needs a Quickie Mark. So I try and do that all the time where he goes, I do. Ah. Did I do it? Wasn't that amazing? Like, so when Hank still voiced up who... Hank, I, he wouldn't call himself a singer, but somehow he managed to float up to that note. It's pretty great. I loved it when Apu would sing. I don't think there's a time in the shower I don't attempt that note. I think I do it every time. My girlfriend, like, I think she's worried. I think she's worried. <laughs> maybe, maybe some context. You could say, listen, darling, this is the dream. If I could just fucking hit this note, then I can tick that thing off my box, off my list. 
there's there's value in shortening the list if you possibly can. I'm just going to send her that clip of you saying that to her. She'll be like, okay. what the bloody hell is going on? What? She's going to be terrified. <laughs> How does she know what you're doing in the shower? <laughs> oh God, I've said too much. <laughs> you can just like delete, delete, delete. There's probably about one question in this interview that's usable now. It's great. I love it. Probably. It's hello, cut, goodbye. <laughs> yes. Maybe you could bleep out all my swears. I'm a terrible swearer. That's one of the things about oil and water is that I swear a lot. It's just sort of what I, it's just sort of part of my vernacular, but we bleep them out hilariously as if you couldn't tell or take it. If you heard me say, fuck, 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 so many times. <laughs> That's what I want in the Simpsons sequel. We saw Bart's penis in the first one. I just want Lisa to just yes. fucking go in on, on Skinner or someone. Fucking go in, yes. Just drag him. Wouldn't that be great? That'd be so funny. Well, if we do do the hit and run new game, let's, let's do that and Grand Theft Auto. It'll be like a merge of the two. Okay, I'll pitch it. If you make loads of money off this and I get nothing, <laughs> thank you so much for this. This has been like a dream come true. Honestly, I'm the happiest I've been. This is great. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure. I really, really love your show. And this is really, really fun. I'd, lo I'd like, like to come back sometime. What are you doing tomorrow? <laughs> Let's just do it every day. That would actually be really funny. <laughs> and between you and me, I really, really love your show. I don't suppose you hear about that often. No, not so much. You know, it is funny, though. I do have people come up to me and say, uh, I never watch your show. Or your show used to be good. It's not good anymore. Why? Oh, yeah. It's interesting. My theory is that television is such an intimate medium. So oftentimes, you, because you've been, obviously, you're watching television in your home, maybe it's three in the morning, you can't sleep, and you're in bed in your underwear, and you're watching, I did a movie called Maximum Overdrive, right? An, an old Stephen King movie. And it's this cult classic. And so... Then when they see me in the supermarket, there's uh, this intimacy where they feel like, oh my God, I saw you last night as though I was there too. I'm like, not, not really there, not quite there while you were in your undies. You're going, Shh, stop telling people. I know, right? You get me a lot of trouble. I didn't know you saw me in your cupboard. <laughs> so I think... You and when obviously when you're a public person and I'm not even like that huge of a public person, people feel as though they can just welcome themselves to an opinion of what you do. It's part of the job. So you're like, okay, well, mm, okay, you don't watch the show. I'm all right. I, I hope you have a nice day. I want you to return and go, no, you should go, you know what? You're a shit accountant. Piss off. <laughs> Give them a taste of their own medicine. Sometimes you do, depending on how they, I mean, it's never really worth it, but once in a while you do want to say, oh, that's interesting. What do you do? And then if they say like, well, you know, I'm an accountant, you go, how many times have you fucked up those numbers? <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. What? Yeah. So, you know, but I haven't yet. I haven't yet. I'm just keeping that in my back pocket. <laughs> did you ever do wrong addition huh in the nicest way i might replace my hat with one that just says how many times you fucked up those numbers yardley smith 2022 yes yardley smith oh my god if you did that people would be like holy shit what does that mean that would be really funny oh that's so funny again thank you so much for this this has been don't tell anyone else on my channel, but my favorite interview. You're the best. You're the best. Thank you. This made my day. I miss you already. Same. Again, I'm going to cry. I'm a fragile state now. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure. And I'll talk to you when we definitely 100% confirm the Simpsons movie too, which is definitely 100% happening. It will happen. I really do feel in my, in my bones, in my guts, it'll happen. Thank you so much. This has been great. <laughs> Thank you, Daniel. Miss you already. Love you. Bye.